Hello there. I may be safely disinfected. The big danger I have is no haircut for three months. So hopefully that does not oh, scare man. you. We are watching. <laughs> we are watching all companies, big and small, impacted by this pandemic. And we are so fortunate to be joined by two CEOs of two very big and influential med tech companies to see how they are both adjusting and innovating during this time. Of course, you've heard they are the CEOs of Boston Scientific, Mike Mahoney, and the CEO of Siemens Healthineers, Bern Montag. So thank you so much for being with us. My first question, you both run global companies with workforces in the tens of thousands operating in dozens of countries. So how are you facing the operational challenges being brought on by this pandemic? Mike, could I ask you to answer first? Sure. Thanks, Janet. Good luck with your haircut in the future here. Um, a couple of things. It's amazing. It was only in early January, we were at an investor conference and uh, we were talking about uh, COVID in China only. And we were worried that China represents 6% of our sales. But at that time, which seems very naive now, the view was it was never going to come to Europe or to, uh, to the U.S. And so it was kind of even out of our purview. Um, so now the biggest thing is, uh, you know, leading through this uncertainty. And what we try to do to simplify things is really focus on uh, the three priorities. And the first one being our employees. Um, Ensuring their safety, we have uh, we're in 130 countries, so ensuring the safety of our manufacturing teams, distribution teams, uh, so that's that's job number one. Uh, secondly, has been really to support uh, the hospitals. You know, we're still doing. Uh, we disclosed in uh, April we were down 45 percent, so we're still doing 55 percent of our volume. So supporting the nurses and the doctors in the procedures uh, in a safe way and providing the remote services that we need uh, to help you know, to do our part. Uh, and the third thing has been where a lot of emphasis, as I imagine the same thing with Burn, is all on the resiliency of Boston Scientific and all the different scenario planning uh, that we've done in terms of uh, the impact on our financials. Uh, great efforts we've done, gone into to ensure uh, excellent liquidity in terms of our uh, financial stability, even in a potential, you know, down, downside scenarios. And really taking action based on that um, to ensure that we have adequate supply, but also taking a significant amount of variable cost out of the company, given that sales reductions, but ensuring that we do so in a way that we keep the strong culture and employee engagement. So really, those are the three pillars, uh, focusing on our employee safety, uh, working closely with our physician customers, and the ensuring that Boston Scientific comes out stronger post-COVID, even though we're, uh, it's been a significant impact on the business. And Bernd, can I ask you, what presently is the biggest challenge that you're facing at Siemens Health and Ears? Yeah, biggest challenge. I mean, just, it's it's um, very similar to what Mike said. I mean, uh, and I only want to differ in number three. I mean, number one, we, uh, it's about the safety of our employees. Um, but secondly, I mean, uh, every hour, 240,000 patients are either diagnosed or treated on systems we have built. Yeah, so supporting our customers in the normal core, in, in the normal healthcare, is super important. I mean, we cannot just shut down. And the third topic is that we play a crucial role in fighting the disease. Yeah, so we have. Uh, AI algorithms to diagnose lung, uh, um, the disease. We have, um, super importantly, we have an, a, a molecule, we have in rapid speed developed a molecular test uh, and a serology test and antibody test. We have put CT scanners in containers to, to help supply uh, in, in uh, emergency hospitals and so on and so on. Yeah? So it is about also how, how can we use our power to help in, in this crisis? And doing all these three things together is basically the challenge, but to some extent also the opportunity or the why, uh, why we exist as Siemens Health. Museum. Yes, from the CEOs that we've been hearing today, it seems that the common theme is everyone's business has doubled in that you have to keep your present business while also dealing with the new business of this crisis. And business interruption takes on greater urgency when your business impacts life and death. So I want to ask each of you, and maybe burned you first, how your model of innovation is changing? Because 
you do want to take care of not just the future patients that you just referred to, the, the current patients that you referred to, but also the future patients. Yeah, I mean, the model of innovation, I mean, nowadays, um, I mean, what we learn is, I mean, here there is a super urgent topic and there is focus. And what we have learned is that, you know, when we really focus on just this one thing, we want to have a serology test, we want to have an AI algorithm, we want to put a CT scanner in a container, we can be much faster. Yeah, um, And that's also a learning for the future. Yeah, that, that this crisis mode will teach us something, how we will act in, in the new now, yeah, so that I'm saying new normal. Um, and this innovation model based on agility, on, 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 on uh, um, urgency, yeah, but also on just one focus on one thing is um, something which um, will have, have an impact for, um, on us for the years to come, even when the, when the pandemic is over. Mike, do you believe that the model of medical innovation is forever changed because of the pandemic? And if so, how? You know, for us uh, and innovations, it's always been very close collaboration with uh, our R&D teams, uh, physicians, uh, you know, payers, clinical science, uh, organically, as well as uh, M&A and uh, we have about four investments in 40 venture companies. So I think those types of things, you know, will, will, will continue. For us, uh, a lot of the changes is in business model innovation. You know, historically, we're flying doctors around the world to teach on aortic valve replacement or uh, left atrial appendage closure. And now we're doing uh, remote, proctoring, remote proctoring from Europe by uh, expert physicians for new products in Japan without flying uh, employees there in a, in a safe way. So I think the, uh, the business model innovation is gonna be significant uh, in terms of how we interact with uh, hospitals, how we train physicians, how we train our sales reps, our commercial reps. Uh, so I think the, all the focus on digitalization uh, has just been further amplified. So I think there's gonna be some terrific, one positive thing from COVID is the uh, acceleration of digital tools and capabilities, which are very proven to be very, very efficient. But that can't always help issues like your supply chain and manufacturing. How are you dealing that when so much of this is happening in so many different countries? Uh, on the supply chain side, that's been a major focus for us. So thankfully, all of our manufacturing uh, facilities have been up. Uh, we've had less than 60 cases of COVID globally. We have a whole uh, doctor team that and a hotline for our employees. Our distribution centers have remained open. And so we provide, you know, very safe, you know, we provide a safe environment. We switch shifts. We close off lines if there's just, uh, any COVID uh, uh, risk. Uh, we have thermal scanning in place. We'll do more advanced testing in the future. So uh, it's it, critical that our supply chain resiliency remains very strong because these products are needed to help save lives. And so we've been successful in doing that. And it's also taught us that we need uh, greater resiliency. Uh, we need uh, you know, more diversification of our supplier base. Um, it's helped us with some of our uh, just uh, action plans in terms of uh, scenario planning. So that along again with the, the digital tools, all of our key suppliers are facing the same thing. So we're able to communicate with them very effectively. Uh, if anything, in terms of supply chain, I think the, take the financials away because the disruption has been significant. But capabilities, be it supply chain or otherwise, um, you know, a lot of benefits from it, actually. Mike, uh, with only 60 positive cases with the size of your workforce, and your workforce is the size of some towns, I think people may be looking to you to see how you manage to do your containment measures. Uh, I would like to ask, Byrne, how are you thinking now of bringing all of your workforce back to work. We know that in every company, not everyone is back to work. And what are some of the changes that are going to be happening there when they do come back to work? Yeah, I mean, back to work doesn't mean they don't work currently. And so to qualify this a little bit, I mean, we have, when you look at our 50, about, about 53,000 employees in 75 countries, by the way, it also means 75 different um, situations. 
uh, or, or um, me, um, about 50% of our workforce is working from home. Yeah, so this is, uh, um, and um, uh, and then it, of course, when it comes to production service or so, these, um, um, the health engineers who are in that roles, you know, are doing the normal work under new environment, you know, with a little bit, you know, social distancing, we are separating shifts um, and so on, so that there cannot be infections and so on. Um, the switch to home office has been um, extremely fast and it worked extremely well. Um, and I'm very, very sure that it will change our way of working forever. Yeah, In the way of um, um, sometimes being more eff efficient, um, um, more focused, um, you know, avoiding um, some unnecessary travel um, um, and so on. Yeah. So when we say back, um, it will not be the same as in the past. Um, we will be very clear that it is everybody's own choice whether you want to go to the office or not. Yeah. And it will be based on the preference of how somebody works. Yeah, some people who learn for an exam learn in the library because they can concentrate at, in the library. <laughs> so at a different place, others are better when they are in a familiar environment. Yeah. So, um, and and I think what it changes is what is accepted. Yeah. So it is not ex it's not necessary anymore to physically show up. And I also believe that when it comes to, and that's what Mike and I chatted about before we started here, and also when we talk with customers, when we have board meetings and so on and, and so on, to some extent, it's just a tradition that you need to physically show up. Yeah. But now we, we all see it's possible also in other ways, and it's not a sacrifice necessarily. Yeah. So um, I believe um, we will we will not come back in the same way we have we have gone into this. Um, and the change will be good. So I think it's a it's a it's an accelerator when it comes to digitalization um, internally and externally. It reminds me of a meme that I saw recently that along the lines of we are going to find out now exactly how many of those in-person meetings did not have to be in person. But Mike, I want to ask you, with a company like yours, where a lot of scientists are involved and research in labs, can you also tell us briefly some of the changes in the way that Boston Scientific is having to pivot in order to bring everyone back? Sure. So everyone's still working. It's, a, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I asked our head of uh, Jody, our CIO, we're averaging 15,000 Microsoft Teams meetings a day around the world which is a lot of meetings. Um, so our, our, our stance basically, as I mentioned before, our, R &D, our manufacturing facilities and distribution centers around the world are, are open and with different shifts and so forth. In terms of uh, the main facilities and headquarters, uh, we're gonna be very, very careful there. We're gonna have our first uh, back to work uh, in four different phases. That first phase will start next week and we'll essentially bring back about 10% of the workforce. And that is, as you indicated, is focused on product development and quality. So we, we deem them most critical to be in the office because of the, the labs and so forth that they work in. But essentially phase one beyond them, everybody else works from home. So it's really not a choice. We want only them to come in until we uh, test all the, uh, you know, to make sure all the thermal scanning works, make sure we don't have uh, any issues there. Eventually we'll be putting uh, tracing capabilities in place. And then we'll bring a second wave back, and those employees will be ones that really have to be in the office a couple days a week. But if you can do your job uh, effectively remotely, uh, we don't see them coming back to work for quite a while. As Bernard was saying, I think this is going to have some pretty significant changes in terms of our employee behavior and how we react. But hopefully by the end of the year, maybe we'll have 50% of our facilities uh, in use. But we're going to start very slowly because working remotely has worked well except for R&D. And we have people doing their best in R&D, but they need to be in the labs. And so we're going to keep them safe and put them as priority number one. And everyone else can do a pretty good job from home until we have uh, further testing. 
All right. We are seeing so many new collaborations being brought on by this crisis, including some innovative private and public partnerships that I think no one would have even imagined before. Baron, can you tell us a little bit of what Siemens Health has been doing in the effort, in the global effort? Yeah, I, mean, I think um, what when I take a step back, I mean, what you know, when 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 what I think what this crisis shows is how important a functioning healthcare system is. Yeah, now seven billion people look at how good is a, a local healthcare system, a national healthcare system. Maybe for the first time uh, in the history of mankind, billions of people know the name of the health minister of their country. Yeah, and know the importance of technology and so on and so on, which is great. Yeah, looking at you know for our you know for for the for the world we have chosen yeah as you know as, whether we are physicians or whether as I lost audio. Are, uh, um, uh, whether we are running companies yeah so it makes our industry and what we are doing much much more important and um, the role of a global company I believe is in, it's it's there's one saying which I really like medtech is global but healthcare is local. Yeah, and so our role as global companies is to also connect the dots to see what's possible. To tell, I mean, to some extent, we used our connections in China and what our Chinese team did to explain in Italy what needs to happen. Yeah, so that is a role we can play, and we can play better than than other players. Yeah. All right, we've been having some audio issues and we apologize for that, but that's what happens when you are using technology to have one of these meetings. But thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experience and also the look ahead.